under the Center for Social Justice, Glide. And today's topic, True Sanctuary, San Francisco City of Hope. But before we start, I want to do a land acknowledgement, uh, acknowledgement, excuse me. We acknowledge that we are on the unsucceeded ancestral homeland of the Ramatu Shaloni, who are the original uh, inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatu Shalom have never seceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as first people. A little bit about the Center for Social Justice. Glide Center for Social Justice works to influence public policy and perception on justice and human rights. Our policy advocacy, community organizing, experiential education, and thought leadership seeks to drive social change by amplifying community voices, influencing mindsets, creating new cultural practices, and transforming institutions of power. A little bit about me. I've worked in community for 26 years advocating for truly affordable housing and cultural protection centered in race and equity for the low income and immigrant communities, eventually creating cultural districts as a model for cultural preservation citywide and growing nationally. I want to introduce our host, Olga Telamante, is the executive director of the Foundation CLF in the first and UC Santa Cruz and honorary doctorate degree from the University of San Francisco. She is widely respected for activism and leadership in the Chicanx, Latin American solidarity, LGBTQ, immigrant, and progressive political movement. She currently co-chairs the at the border. Olga. Thank you, Eric. Um, and uh, really great to be here with all of you. Thank you all for joining us um, for this important topic. Uh, thank you, Eric, for coordinating this powerful panel um, of experts um, in, in the topic at hand, uh, which is sanctuary, of course. I also want to thank uh, Shiva Bandiva for uh, providing administrative and technical support, very important, uh, to make all this run uh, smoothly. So, um, you know, I was uh, just uh, reflecting on, on, on the word sanctuary, because I think we we, we do hear it. We I've, I know I have heard it throughout my life. Um, and usually related it to um, religious roots because uh, many times churches uh, were sanctuaries. Um, and of course, sanctuary can refer to a temple or a church. Uh, in this case, we're talking about our city. Um, and the, the term has broadened to include anywhere that people need to go for safety and protection. Uh, and that is certainly what the policy is aimed to provide to our immigrant community. Um, it also it can be seen as a way to, uh, it, it refers to shelter or asylum from uh, political danger. Um, and that's, that's been used in a lot of our Latin American um, countries um, when people are seeking sanctuary at embassies or in churches. Um, and I also like the fact that uh, it, it refers to, uh, sometimes to like bird sanctuaries, um, which is, um, it does provide a place for birds to live and be protected. And I think that it's such a beautiful um, sentiment that can be extended into to, to, uh, humans, <laughs> to, our, to our immigrant folks especially. They deserve um, and need to, to live safely and be protected. So let me go on to... Um, in, uh, introduce the, the, the panelists uh, that you'll be hearing from. Um, we'll be in conversation and we're really gonna take advantage of their expertise and many years of work um, in, in the field of immigration rights. So uh, first I'm gonna introduce Sarah Gavigan. Um, she is a senior staff attorney in the immigration legal program of Addison, um, San Francisco. And she, um, be, since being admitted to the California Bar in November 2013. Uh, Sarah has represented unaccompanied children as well as families in their fight against deportation, both as an attorney with 
Children's Project in Texas, and now with Paris in San Francisco. Uh, she is a part of the San Francisco Immigrant Legal Defense Collaborative. I know that's an amazing group of many organizations. Um, and she envisions a just and equitable world in which no human is subject to persecution, no immigrant faces deportation without legal representation, and everyone enjoys the basic human right of free and safe movement. So we're very, very pleased to have you, uh, Sarah, with us, with all your experience. And welcome back. I know you were part of the um, the uh, Caravan for the Children delegation to Central America, um, where we sent this, this group to find out um, the realities of, of, of the challenges and the resources available so the families can um, continue to be reunited with the children that were separated from them. Uh, starting in 2018 with the Trump policy. So thank you for going on that trip as well and joining us here today. Um, I also want to introduce uh, Sarah uh, Sousa. Uh, she serves as a legislative aide to San Francisco Board President Aaron Peskin um, and also serves on the Immigrant Rights Commission and chairs the Language Access Committee. She is a member of IFPTE Local 21 in Chapter and the vice president, excuse me, of the San Francisco chapter of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, AFL-CIO. Uh, so good to have that labor expertise as well. Um, she's committed to fighting for immigrant rights, economic justice, and advancing equitable solutions to empower the most disadvantaged communities, including representation in government. So thank you so much, um, Sarah, for joining us. Um, y, y no, no dejamos lo, lo mejor para lo último, ¿verdad? Um, uh, last but certainly not least, we're so glad to have Sofía Ríos Dorantes. Um, Sofía began volunteering with the Amigos de Cleto Collective, Collective in Mexico in 1998, where she served LGBT and heterosexual HIV communities. Then in 2001, she fled Mexico to North Carolina and eventually to San Francisco to seek asylum. Um, she started volunteering, uh, first um, looking for services at EA para Trans Latinas, a great organization here in the city, uh, and then became a volunteer. And then she was hired uh, to be a data specialist uh, in 2018. And she received very specific Salesforce training, um, making her the first certified Latina transgender data specialist. And then since then, she has just continued moving up the ranks. Um, and now she's the deputy director of uh, EA para Trans Latinas. Uh, she is an indigenous transgender woman from San Gabriel, Chilac, Puebla, Mexico. Mucho gusto que estés aquí con nosotras, uh, Sofía. Um, so Thank you so much. Just, uh, I think someone put on the chat, it's a, uh, it's a uh, powerhouse women, absolutely. I'm, I'm just honored to be with all of you, fighters and activists and organizers and, and again, experts in the area. So on the topic of sanctuary, we're going to uh, get started with uh, Sarah uh, Sousa. And I'm, um, I'm going to ask you, uh, Sarah, to tell us um, what is a sanctuary city and what is the history uh, of, of sanctuary cities in in why is it why is it important? Why do you think it's so important? Thank you so much, Olga, and I'm so honored to be part of this panel. Thank you, Glide, Eric Aguelo, uh, all the planning committee, and all the amazing women that are on this panel. Uh, this is a very personal uh, issue for myself as an undocumented immigrant. Uh, I've been uh, undocumented and with DACA for 22 years, uh, an immigrant from Brazil, and I understand and have a lived experience of the of the importance of sanctuary. And I really appreciate the reference to birds. Uh, for me, it reminds me of butterflies, so you can fly, fly free uh, without fear of deportation and, you know, have a life with dignity and respect. Uh, so I just wanted to start with that. 
Uh, Sanctuary Ordinance actually promotes uh, public trust and cooperation. It helps keep our community safe, not only immigrant families, but all San Francisco's. San Franciscans by making sure that all the residents, uh, you know, regardless of immigration status, feel comfortable calling uh, the police, the fire department, accessing services that are essential for their survival. It keep our communities healthy by making sure that all residents feel comfortable accessing health service as well, particularly during the pandemic uh, when you know there was a crisis and uh, the future was so uncertain for immigrants, uh, for their status, you know, not being eligible for federal resources. So the city really had to uh, step up and support immigrant families. And, you know, sanctuary was key in ensuring that they could uh, feel comfortable accessing those services. So in 18, uh, in, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, in 1989, uh, San Francisco passed the first uh, city and county of refugee, which is also known as the sanctuary ordinance, uh, which, you know, prohibits uh, city employees uh, from discriminating uh, undocumented immigrants from accessing services, uh, but also uh, prohibits any collaboration with ICE only with the cases of discrimination. But it doesn't limit any uh, enforcement in cases of uh, criminal cases or court decisions. So it does create room for uh, you know, safe communities LGBTQ communities, women, families that have faced domestic violence uh, to feel safe in their homes and report any you know, issues or you know, participate in the community uh, with, again, like I mentioned before, with dignity and respect. So it was first uh, you know, introduced and uh, you know, signed in 1989. Uh, in 2013, uh, San Francisco passed the due process for all ordinance. This ordinance limits when city law enforcement officers uh, give adv advance notice to ICE, uh, you know, using their, uh, you know, immigration status to discriminate against them or target them um, when, you know, uh, it's not permitted under the law. Um, and, and the reason why I'm emphasizing that part uh, about the collaboration with the law is to dismissify or dismantle any misinformation that's out there about sanctuary, uh, which the language specifies under chapter 12H, uh, which I recommend uh, everyone to read, to read it closely to better understand the language. And uh, also in 2016, was um, less amended, uh, which reinforces, uh, you know, the code, uh, which is uh, to ensure that uh, undocumented or all San Francisco, San Francisco residents can access city resources uh, without any fear of, uh, you know, the city collaborating with ICE, any investigation, detention, arrest uh, related to alleged, uh, you know, violations with the civil provisions, unless it's again uh, required by, you know, uh, the law or, you know, there's a court case uh, pending, then, you know, there's some provisions within the law that permits that collaboration and, you know, in order to just, you know, keep our community safe. Uh, but the, the main, the core, the heart of sanctuary is to ensure that communities are thriving, are safe, uh, and they are, you know, welcome uh, to participate in our, you know, city and county, uh, provide, you know, also information about, you know, uh, limit circumstances where, you know, there is uh, permission to, you know, report certain cases as we have seen in the past. Uh, so overall, and I'll provide additional details, and you can also uh, refer back to all this information through OSEA, Office of Immigration Affairs, all the details are included. Uh, but again, sanctuary is not only crucial, but it's a tool to keep our community safe and that there is no fear of deportation, especially after uh, you know, the 
45th Trump administration that directly targeted black and brown immigrants um, and you know uh, due to racism and systemic barriers uh, unfortunately, uh, due to ripple effects, we're seeing some of the wave of uh, discriminatory, uh, you know, targets in our own city and county. Uh, so this discussion is critical to ensuring that we're furthering uh, a more informed discussion on sanctuary and that we have all the information necessary and a better understanding of Chapter 12H to, uh, you know, really uh, you know, have a better outcome and protect our immigrants um, from being targeted by uh, any uh, federal, state, or local discriminatory uh, uh, targeting. So thank you. I realized I was muted. Um, to, yeah, so that's, uh, it helps with the, the sound. Thank you, um, Sarah, for providing that. Um, would you be able to put in the chat, you referred to um, uh, one of the offices where people can actually um, get information. I, and I think you can, if you can put it in the chat, that would be helpful because um, as you mentioned, there there are attempts to give misinformation and it's the kind of thing that worries people. As we know, you know, there's the narrative of, um, this is this is harboring people that that have committed crimes and so on, and so it's very important to be able to debunk um, those um, allegations. Um, if people do commit crimes, they are definitely then um, held accountable um, under the regular laws. The main thing here is that to not use immigration status as a way to criminalize, um, or you know, anyone that is detained. Um, so I just um, uh, appreciate the clarification. Go ahead, Sarah, anything else? I also, uh, I first added uh, the ordinance itself, uh, chapter 12H, because it has specific language. And then I'm also adding OCS link uh, for more information and additional resources. And uh, any type of violations against uh, sanctuary can be reported to Human Rights Commission. Uh, and there is also a tool for that. So I just wanted to add thank you, Olga. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for adding that. Let me ask um, Sarah uh, Gavigan, um, uh, what do you think is driving the current efforts to water down the sanctuary city protections? Um, what what are the, the, the myths and, and misinformation that, that we need to be aware of? Um, so you could help us with that, uh, Sarah Gavigan. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think, as you said, watered down, you know, that might be even the nice way of putting it. I think um, we saw sanctuary policy come under attack recently um, in sort of in the Board of Supervisors realm um, specifically. Um, but I think, um, I think, you know, the, the short way of saying it is that um, this is a, an example of scapegoating. I think, um, you know, scapegoating immigrants for an issue that the city is going through, um, you know, namely um, the fentanyl um, sort of crisis that we're seeing. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it would, yeah. So I think sort of the why we're seeing it, an attack on sanctuary is to cut, to scapegoat one group of people and be able to say, this is a quick fix if we just deport everybody then the fentanyl crisis, poof, you know, like then we'll be fine. And um, I think most of us, when we sit and think about whether that's actually going to be effective, um, you know, we can see that it's not, where there's a larger social issue, like things like addiction, inequality, social inequality, um, uh, economic inequality going on. Um, it's, you know, to scapegoat one um, subsection of the, population, um, you know, when elections are coming up or when um, there's a some part of the population that thinks, um, you know, I just can't look at this anymore. What are we doing about this? You know, people are politicians, some may feel some pressure from certain sectors of the society. Um, and to say, I have, you know, I know what we can do. We can make sure that people, you know, some people that are selling, because not everyone that's 
for example, selling or using is an immigrant, but it's a way to be able to quickly respond to concerned citizens that may not have a, a depth of understanding of the of the social issues, frankly, and they just want to know what are we doing. And I think um, we've seen it, you know, so again, the short answer is it's, it's a scapegoating um, um, way around addressing a much, you know, more complex public health um, issue. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, and again, um, I can go more into whether that, you know, would really work or not, but, um, you know, I, I, it certainly is no. And I will also point out, um, you know, again, sort of framing the issue of, of because, because, and just to bring us back, I mean, really the issue is this particular um, uh, time that sanctuary policy was under attack in the, with the Board of Supervisors, it was to specifically um, provide a carve out for, to allow ICE, excuse me, to allow our city government, to, sorry, my dog's barking in the background, if you can hear, to not, to allow our um, district attorney, for example, to communicate with ICE um, when there is someone undocumented, there's some, <laughs> there's an undocumented person um, who may be involved in um, fentanyl sales or have, has been in the past um, to, to allow ICE to then let's either come into the jail to, to get them afterwards or um, I'm sorry, let me just stop my dog. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think your dog doesn't like the, uh, the watering down and the attacks on uh, Sanctuary City. It's very clear. So um, hooray for your dog. So, uh, but I, I, I appreciate that, that you're bringing that um, up, um, Sarah, that because it, the, the, the fentanyl crisis, as we know, is, is, is real. It's affecting so many people. It's causing great havoc and disaster in our communities. And so it's a way to just kind of respond to it. It seems like sort of kind of a knee-jerk reaction. It's like, well, then let's make sure that we, uh, let's not, that, let's not, um, uh, keep the sanctuary policies, you know, so that we can easily uh, identify the immigrants that, you know, supposedly are bringing in the, the drugs, which we know is factually not true. So um, just wanted to, you know, kind of circle that part of it in terms of like, why is there is there this attack now? You know, and like I said, it, it, it's, uh, it recited uh, with one of the um, uh, supervisors um, that was trying to get um, legislation in the Board of Supervisors. Now, that didn't take place, um, right, Sarah? Um, but it seems like they're still concerned that, that something else could happen in terms of like a ballot measure or continued um, narrative of engaging the public in a way to uh, put the blame on, on the immigrant community um, and then and, and the undocumented community in particular. Uh, about the crisis, um, the other crises that are going on in the city. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And I and um, this kind of goes into also talking about how do we protect, you know, sanctuary. But I think, um, as you said, it was the ordinance at the Board of Supervisors level to carve to have a carve out in our sanctuary policy for certain fentanyl related um, uh, charges or convictions. Um, that did not, that was not successful, um, and it, and which is good. But um, it still is a risk that it could be a ballot measure. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that we need to be, for those of us who really see the benefit of sanctuary policy in creating more public safety, in creating more civic, allowing for more civic engagement of everybody and, you know, um, protecting, protecting against discrimination. It's a real slippery slope, you know, um, as far as um, all of the potential negative effects of not having sanctuary city. Um, so those of us who want to keep it, you know, really need to be ready to be engaged. Um, if this a to not let it get on the ballot, but if it did, you know, to vote against it um, and under understanding that, you know, immigration needs to be separate from other um, uh, from when we're talking about, you know, um, issues like fentanyl or 
even anything criminally related, they're completely separate systems and they don't really need to be mixed and, and bad things happen, you know, on a social level when they are um, in, in our minds and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. And that's why it's so important to have uh, this kind of uh, conversation. And thank you again, Glide, for, for providing this forum so that our community can be in, informed and, and be alert to um, uh, any attack on, on the sanctuary city uh, policy um, and and speaking of you know the, the, the community that is primarily targeted, which is our our immigrant and undocumented um, community, I wanted to bring uh, Sophia into the conversation um, and to tell us about the local undocumented immigrant community as as she knows it, as she lives it. What are the contributions, the successes, the struggles? Um, and just to let you know, Sophia will give her. Um, a contribution to the conversation in Spanish. And we have um, Aura um, who will translate um, the, the, the statements uh, by Sofía. So, Sofía, podemos empezar con, con la primera eh, parte de, de, de la conversación que nos cuente sobre la comunidad local de inmigrantes. Y ya sabes, eh, hacer las primeras eh, cinco párrafos para darle oportunidad a Aura a um, so Sofia will, will, will start and then um, Aura will, will translate. Yeah, thank you so much. Gracias, Olga. Eh, honestamente, eh, yo me mudé a San Francisco, California hace eh, siete años, eh, pero he mirado eh, cómo ha surgido o cómo ha sido eh, o cómo es la vida de nosotros o de nosotros como personas inmigrantes indocumentadas aquí en San Francisco, California, en la Bahía. Eh, la comunidad local de inmigrantes indocumentados en San Francisco, California, ha hecho contribuciones significativas al tejido cultural, económico y social de la ciudad. Ah, desde el bullicioso distrito de la Misión hasta otros vecindarios como en el que yo vivo, en el Tenderloin, Eh, los inmigrantes indocumentados hemos desempeñado un papel vital en la configuración de la identidad diversa de la ciudad. Hemos hecho contribuciones significativas a la economía de San Francisco, trabajando en diversas industrias como hotelería, la construcción, la atención médica y sobre todo la agricultura. Eh, el, arduo el, arduo, perdón, el arduo trabajo y dedicación Eh, han ayudado a impulsar el crecimiento y la prosperidad de la ciudad. Además, los miembros de la comunidad indocumentada hemos participado activamente en la vida cívica local. Hemos contribuido a la vitalidad de eventos comunitarios, festivales culturales, tales como el Día de Muertos, e iniciativas de base, organizaciones como la Comisión de Derechos de los Inmigrantes de San Francisco, y varios grupos sin fines de lucro, tales como el que, porque yo trabajo en la Parate Latinas o Cares en San Francisco, que están aquí presentes, eh, trabajan inalcanzablemente, o trabajamos inalcanzablemente para defender los derechos y el bienestar de los inmigrantes indocumentados. Sin embargo, la comunidad indocumentada también enfrenta numerosos desafíos y lucha. Una de las preocupaciones más importante es el miedo a la deportación, ya que las políticas de inmigración y las medidas de cumplimiento pueden crear ansiedad e incertidumbre entre las personas indocumentadas y sus familias. A pesar de las políticas vigentes en San Francisco para proteger a las personas indocumentadas y ser una ciudad santuario, aún existe el miedo de enfrentar el riesgo de detención y deportación. Uh -huh. Muy bien, gracias, uh, Sofía. Now we're going to have Aura uh, translate that part of um, Sofía's statement. I moved to San Francisco seven years ago. I've been living and seeing how the undocumented immigrant community has to cope with all the with everything in the city. The local undocumented immigrant community in San Francisco, California, has made significant contribution to the cultural, economic, and social fabric of the city. From the bustling district to the to other neighborhoods, like the neighborhood in which I live, uh, the Tenderloin, undocumented immigrants have played a vital role in shaping the diverse identity of the city. 
they have made significant contribution to the San Francisco economy by working in different uh, industries. Such as hospitality, construction, agriculture, and medical attention. Their hard work and dedication have helped drive the growth and prosperity of the city. Additionally, members of the undocumented community have participated actively in local civic actions. They have contributed to the vitality of the community events, cultural festivals such as Dia de los Muertos and other initiatives. Organizations like the San Francisco Immigrant Rights Commissions and several nonprofits groups work tirelessly to defend the rights and well-being of undocumented immigrants. However, the undocumented community also faces numerous challenges and struggles. A major concern is the fear of deportation signs, immigration policies and enforcement measures can create anxiety and uncertainty among undocumented individuals and their family. Despite the policies enforced in San Francisco to, to protect undocumented individuals and being a sanctuary city, there is still a fear of facing the risk of detention and deportation. It just uh, the fear this you know that that worry that doesn't go away. It has is is persiste. Eh, bueno, sigue con tu con tu presentación. Uh, Gracias. Y seguimos eh, el el acceso a servicios esenciales, incluidos la atención sanitaria y la educación, también puede verse limitado para la comunidad indocumentada. Si bien existen algunas organizaciones e iniciativas que tienen como objet objetivo brindar apoyo, la falta de estatus legal aún puede presentar barreras para acceder plenamente a estos servicios. Otro desafío importante es el que persiste eh, o el persistente es el estigma social y la discriminación que a menudo enfrentamos los inmigran inmigrantes indocumentados. Esto puede conducir a la exclusión, la marginación y oportunidades limitadas de avance social y económico. A pesar de estos obstáculos, muchas personas indocumentadas continuamos mostrando resiliencia, determinación y apoyo comunitario. Varias organizaciones y activistas locales hemos estado trabajando inalcanzablemente para abordar, perdón, para abogar por una reforma migratoria integral, brindar asistencia legal, ofrecer recursos y crear conciencia sobre las contribuciones y los derechos de la comunidad indocumentada aquí en San Francisco y el área de la Bahía. Access to essential services, including healthcare and education, it might be also limited for the undocumented community. Although there are some organizations and initiatives that aim to provide support, lack of legal status can still present some barriers to fully accessing these services. Another important challenge is the social stigma and discrimination that is often faced by undocumented immigrants. This can lead to exclusion, marginalization, and limited opportunities for social and economic advancement. Despite these obstacles, many undocumented individuals continue to exhibit resiliency, determination, and community support. Various organizations and local activists have been working tirelessly to advocate for a comprehensive immigration reform, provide legal assistance, offer resources, and raise awareness of the community contribution and the rights for the undocumented community in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, such important um, points that you're making, Sofia, right, in terms of um, about the undocumented um our undocumented community um and and how with even with great things like the sanctuary policy um nevertheless there's the constant um fear um and worry about of course um patient um, for sure um and also like you said the stigma the the um just the the uh, uh the daily worry and, and i know it's like mm -hmm. it's been privileged myself of not being undocumented and talking with, with with friends you know that that are it's just understanding um just that ongoing reality so that's why it's so important to have a sanctuary policy where then 
our community members feel safe if they do have to report um you know a crime or they have to report violence and to not target it solely on the basis of, yeah. of being undocumented so really important points um that, that you're making uh sofia um i wanted to um uh, ask um also in terms of like from your perspective um okay. why is it important um that to be able to protect this community with the policies and legislation um, that we're talking about. I think you, you've addressed some of it, but um, just specifically, you know, so that our community can can hear, you know, why uh, do we need these these policies um, that, that they can offer protection, um, sanctuary, really, um, to our undocumented community? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it's very important. And... En sí es uh, proteger a la comunidad eh, de, la comunidad de inmigrantes indocumentados aquí en San Francisco eh, con políticas legisla eh, y legislación. Es importante por varias razones. Eh, ante todo es una cuestión de derechos humanos y justicia social, sinceramente. Eh, los inmigrantes indocumentados, como todas las personas, merecemos ser tratadas con dignidad y respeto. Al promulgar políticas que nos protejan, San Francisco puede garantizar que, pueda, que podamos acceder a servicios vitales, oportunidades de empleo y educación sin temor a discriminación o deportación. En segundo lugar, proteger a la comunidad de inmigrantes indocumentados puede tener beneficios económicos. Nosotros los inmigrantes, independientemente de nuestro estatus legal, contribuimos a la economía local como consumidores y trabajadores. Al implementar políticas que brinden protección y apoyo, San Francisco puede crear un entorno más inclusivo que fomente el crecimiento económico y la innovación. Además, cuando los inmigrantes indocumentados nos sentimos seguros y apoyados, nos sentimos más libres de, de interactuar con las demás comunidades locales de denunciar mm. delitos y contribuir a la seguridad y el bienestar general de la ciudad. Esto puede conducir a mejores resultados de seguridad pública y una mayor confianza de la comunidad en la aplicación de la ley. Finalmente, salvaguardar a la comunidad de inmigrantes indocumentados se alinea con los valores de diversidad e inclusión que muchas comunidades, incluida la de San Francisco, aprecian al valorar y proteger a todos los residentes, independientemente de nuestro estatus migratorio, la ciudad puede fomentar un sentido de pertenencia y unidad. Es importante señalar que los beneficios de proteger a la comunidad de inmigrantes indocumentados se extienden más allá de San Francisco. Tales acciones también envían un mensaje de compasión y empatía al resto del país alentando a otras regiones a adoptar políticas y leyes similares que apoyen y protejan a todas las personas independientemente de nuestro estatus migratorio. Gracias. Protecting the undocumented immigrant community in San Francisco, California with policies and legislation is important for several reasons. First and foremost, it is a matter of human rights and social justice. The undocumented immigrants, as everyone else, deserve to be treated, treated with dignity and respect. By enacting policies that protect them, San Francisco can ensure who have access to vital services, employment opportunities, and education without fear of discrimination or deportation. Secondly, protecting the undocumented immigrants community can have economic benefits. Immigrants, regardless of their status, contribute to the local economy as a consumers and workers. The policy implementation provide protection and support in the city of San Francisco and can create a more inclusive environment that encourage economic growth and innovation. Moreover, when undocumented immigrants feel safe and supported, they are more likely to interact with local communities to report crimes and contribute to the safety and general well-being of the city. This can lead to better public safety outcomes and greater community trust in law 
enforcement. Finally, safeguarding the undocumented immigrant community aligns with the values of diversity and inclusion that many community, including in San Francisco, hold dear by valuing, valuing and protecting all residents, regardless of your of their immigration status. The city can foster a sense of belonging and unity. It is important to know that the benefits of protecting the undocumented immigrant community extend beyond San Francisco. Such actions also send a message of compassion and empathy to the rest of the country, encouraging other regions to adopt similar policies and laws that support and protect all the people regardless of their immigration status. Such important points that Sofia is making, um, you know, from the perspective of our undocumented community in terms of like how they deserve to be treated, mm -hmm. like what they contribute, and then also how that um, that example uh, from here can extend to the other communities around around the certainly around the country. I, I know that the that they're. Uh, some of the major cities are, uh, uh, um, in the country, like New York, LA, uh, Seattle, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, Denver, also have sanctuary city policies. Yeah. And it really has been the example of the area. I know that it actually, the first sanctuary city was actually Berkeley, uh, but uh, San Francisco followed uh, very closely and I think enacted a, 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 an even more robust um, sanctuary mm -hmm. policy. So it is really important that your voice and your perspective, Sophia, uh, be magnified, you know, um, so that people understand, again, the the power and, and the beauty um, of our communities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and gracias, uh, Aura. Thank you, Aura, for, for translating it um, so beautifully. Um, You're welcome. So um, I wanted to um, ask... Um, each of you to to um, uh, to speak to uh, specifically in terms of let's say that sanctuary uh, policy. How does it relate to your work? You know how 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 does it impact the work that you do um, day to day um, cases that that you have worked on um, and or or personal impact. So let me go back to um, Sarah uh, uh, Sousa and and just um, you know and then. Uh, Sarah Gavigan and, and and also uh, and Sophia, you know, just to talk about um, how do these policies affect you know your work? Um, why is it important to you personally? Thank you, and thank you so much, Sophia, for you know uplifting uh, you know our strength and resilience. Uh, it's so such a beautiful like empowering comment that you made. Uh, so first, I want to uh, you know emphasize that you know my first part was more like going over like the facts right but when you look at the recent attacks in sanctuary uh we really need to delve into the root causes of criminalization of poverty right and we have to understand what's the systemic issue at hand and it's the city's failure to uh address the fentanyl crisis provide affordable housing to low-income families and public health solutions. When the pandemic hit, the city came together, they coordinated with departments and they addressed the needs of the communities uh, and provide resources to alleviate and mitigate the impact of the pandemic due to the high level of unemployment and disparity. Uh, now the city is offering multiple solutions around you know the fentanyl crisis and public health but because there's a lack of coordination within you know the departments uh, there's uh, you know a failure in addressing the real issue which is uh you know the need to come up with a coordinated plan for a public health crisis and prioritize solutions to affordable housing actually investing or city funding in housing you know homeless families that are struggling imagine if you are homeless you don't have a place to stay you have mental health 
you know, mental health issues, how are you going to survive? And unfortunately, uh, these families that are on the streets are vulnerable. They are affected and unfortunately more likely to consume fentanyl. Our city needs to step up and coordinate our efforts, just like we did during the pandemic. And, you know, uh, not focus on racist uh, ripple effects of the Trump administration that's driving this dialogue. As you can see, uh, you know, national, uh, you know, candidates are, are making reference to our city, and most of them are Republicans, starting with, you know, Florida candidates that are currently targeting our immigrant community. So we need to take it back and look at our resources and how we're driving our city solutions to address uh, poverty and you know the unfortunate effects of the pandemic, which is you know increased level of unemployment, uh, and you know uncertainty not only for the immigrant community but for people of color that have been the most impacted. So I think that should be the priority policy and ensure that we keep protecting sanctuary and strengthen access to resources and civic engagement, because we do need representation. We do need leaders that fight, that understand the needs of the most vulnerable. Unfortunately, there is a lot of focus on uh, you know, the greedy, the corporate interests. We need to really uh, support and work with candidates and, and representatives that are supporting our communities and work with them to further a more equitable policy agenda for all San Franciscans. It should be people first, not not a corporate. So I just want to emphasize that part and 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 with the importance of uh, Sanctuary City, not only for myself, for my family, for my neighbors, for my Latino community and other immigrant communities, again, that are under attack, you know, uh, and we, we need everyone to step up and work together to address our city issues. So and thank you so much again, Glide, for this opportunity to have this important discussion. Well, I can see um, how you are the legislative aide, um, you know, your um, your le legislation and what needs to happen. Uh, thank you for, for sharing, you know, the those those really um, insightful um, words, um, Sarah, but in going beyond, you know, the the issue of, of specifically um, our immigrant community is is the the. Uh, the issues at, at large that our city is facing and they kind of you know, glommed them together we're like, well, it's an immigrant issue, right? As opposed to it's it's a it's it's an overall policy. And like I said, and 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 it's in its lack of coordination with the different services, the different agencies. So this is also a public call to to our our public officials, right? It's like we're not buying, you know, the fact that we're not we're not buying the narrative that, that we're to blame for for the, for these crises, and we're expecting better um, responses uh, from them. Um, so um, let me go to uh, uh, Sarah Gavigan, and um, uh, we have. I think we're going a little bit into the part of the closing of, of the conversation in terms of like um, what can we do to protect the sanctuary ordinance um, or, or even strengthen. It? You know, what are things that people could do? And then I'm also going to ask uh, Sophia. Um, Similar question. Yes, um, I just wanted to say I wholeheartedly agree with my um, co-panelist Sarah, um, and um, yeah, so thank you for for saying it that way. Um, I, you know, also I realized I wanted to make clear as someone who works, you know, as an immigration attorney, and I work in what's called removal defense, which is um, basically deportation defense, helping people defend against deportation. And I just wanted to, to say that sanctuary city as a policy is really a baseline sort of protection that exists to not have, you know, parts of our city government calling ICE and saying, I think I have someone undocumented here. You know, that's what we're trying to avoid, right? But in, that doesn't mean in San Francisco that nobody gets deported. We have an immigration court in San Francisco, two, <laughs> one at 100, um, uh, 100 Montgomery and the other one at um, 630 Sansom. And, um, you know, thousands of people are in what's called re removal proceedings and deportation proceedings. Um, and so, and we do, and that's what the work of the San Francisco Immigrant Legal Defense Collaborative 
does um, is represents um, uh, you know thousands of people at a time, but we're not you know there's there's still more that need services certainly, but in their um, fight to show that they have a way to stay here um, in San Francisco and in the Bay Area. Um, so all that is to say, I hear people a lot in the streets say, oh, we're a sanctuary city. That means that like, you know, no one gets supported here. And it's like, no, <laughs> you know, we, that's, that, that's mm -hmm. part of sort of what we, so we want to defend sanctuary city. So at least people are accessing, you know, services, they're making police reports, they're going to get other um, city funded health services, et cetera, without fear, um, which is just basic you know, giving people dignity to conduct their lives. Um, and then, so, you know, that needs to be protected, certainly. Otherwise, people just go into the shadows and they don't participate, you know, um, in a meaningful way in our society. Um, so, you know, and I also, I'll say what we can do to protect that, but I'll also just shine a little bit of a light on what we can do to go beyond that, too, if you're, if folks are interested. Um, you know, we've already stated if, it, if a ballot measure were to come up to try to make a carve out um, and weaken our sanctuary, sanctuary city policy from a ballot, you know, um, vehicle, then, you know, vote against that um, to keep it strong, to keep sanctuary protection strong. Um, I get, you know, anyone who's feels interested in writing op eds, you know, we've seen a lot of news coverage recently that is um, blaming Hondurans specifically, or just immigrants, you know, making it seem like, again, the more complex social social issue, like um, that's, you know, that has brought about fentanyl use and sale, et cetera, in the city, um, that we need a more coordinated approach. You know, there's, um, we need uh, a long-term plan, you know, for the well-being of our citizens. Um, and it's not as narrow or um, sort of, simple, I guess, is blaming someone from, a, you know, people from a particular country. So to the extent that people want to express that they don't think it's, you know, that that's the narrative that should be, um, that should be touted, please write an op-ed, please um, write a blog, write a Facebook post, you know, like let your community know that it's more com complex um, and that we don't appreciate you know, that type of suggestion is a solution because it's not really a solution and or, or, or invite, you know, a good conversation around the issue. Um, and, you know, this is something, this attacks on Sanctuary City historically have come, you know, through, um, oftentimes they will show up at a board of supervisors, um, you know, meeting, let's say. Um, and so showing up for things like that, um, we always, someone from our organizations that are on this, you know, always show up, but we welcome the wider community to come and show support, um, you know, for or against whatever the, the issue may be that's attacking immigrants, for example, or um, whether even if it's for something that's more positive, which is like, we want to see, you know, funding going towards community programs, which once a year, at least we all have to get to go to city hall and say why our programs are important and things like that. And I think, you know, just showing the Board of Supervisors that you support um, community-based programs as opposed to, you know, a like a arrest and deport sort of solution um, is really important. Because again, you know, some of the work that Cutison does beyond just immigration legal services, we have um, two different social service or another, you know, two different social service programs, one for youth, it's called our second chance youth program and another one like social work for uh, families. Um, and a lot of the important tough work um, goes on, you know, with caseworkers and youth or families and social workers around finding housing or getting into school or getting your, you know, your work permit, you didn't know you qualified for something and then your whole life changes. And maybe, you know, you don't find yourself mixed up in, <clears throat> any end of the, of the fentanyl crisis, let's say. So, um, yeah, supporting community-based organizations is super important because people are on the ground doing the work. Um, and then I, let's see what else. I mean, I think that kind of sums it up even again to, to sort of, cause we're talking about attacks on sanctuary, which could continue to happen over from over more issues than just fentanyl. Right. The current issue is fentanyl, but it, you know, we could see other ones pop justifications for, for trying to um, whittle away at the sanctuary policy. But, 
you know, with regard to this current one and, and sort of the focus and blaming of Honduran youth, for example, um, which is super problematic um, because it just doesn't capture who's actually responsible for, you know, drugs, addiction, the whole, I mean, we've already talked about it, but I think what I want to say is that um, at Cutison, for example, we have a fund that an unaccompanied child who, you know, came to this country by himself and won his asylum case, he wanted to help other youth who weren't really, um, didn't have the resources that he did. Um, and so he, we started this fund called the Venetio Fund at, the, at Cut Essen. And it's a way for people to literally put money into an account that we can give to specifically kids who don't have, who came here unaccompanied, who need jackets, who need um, sometimes rental assistance, who need, you know, money, like a food, uh, a card for food, things like that. So if you want to help meet basic needs of kids who are in the street, for example, that's one way to um, directly do that. Um, and yeah, if there are any, I'll, I'll stop there. And if there are any questions just more broadly about um, deportation in San Francisco and things like that, we can talk later about it. If not, um, I think that covers it. No, that's a, a great um, way to present, you know, what um, the services are that Cadesen offers. I think that's actually, a, it's a great way to um, include it into our, into our discussion. I, I, I want to ask Sofia to talk about AS para Trans Latinas and, and talk about uh, what are the services that are provided and um, how can people learn more about it and participate. And um, Eric and, and Chiba, I, I think uh, if we were able to put the organization's um, you know, websites in the, in the chat so that people know where to get a hold of them. And Tim, with Sarah, I know that you work you know, for um, Supervisor Peskin, um, but they can also contact you because you were very knowledgeable, um, Sarah Sousa, and, um, uh, in terms of, of the work that you do around immigration. So I'm just saying, this is amazing richness of expertise. And as you can see, uh, these are like legislative aides, lawyers, you know, deputy directors, but they're like really strong organizers because <laughs> like their, their work, they're talking about how to get um, the community engaged, how to get you engaged, how to get, how to get you informed. Those of you who are, uh, you know, here with us with your generous um, uh, use of your time to learn about this important uh, topic. So I want to ask um, Sofia um, to share about the work of um, AS para Trans Latinas. Um, how is it that people can support? Uh, how does it support specifically the undocumented uh, um, community? So um, te lo dejo para que contestes eh, sobre el trabajo que hace eh, AS para Trans Latinas. Y ahora también eh, te puede eh, traducir. Ok, uh, gracias, Olga. Well, I will try to explain all this in, in English so I can let Aura es, que se relaje un poquitito. Okay. Eh, well, el, <laughs> el Abra Trans Latinas es una uh, uh, organización for transgen uh, transgender community, but actually more now for um, unconforming. Eh, Gen, um, unconforming gen, gender and unconforming communities and also intersex and but mostly trans latinas who they came coming from uh, mexico and south america and right now we we, we see them uh, on the news that a lot of people it's uh coming to the united states looking for uh for uh for a new opportunity to live here in the United States. So part of them, it's our trans, uh, trans community also. And what they are looking here is mostly asylum. Why? Because uh, in our countries, in Mexico, in South America, in Central America, we are still uh, facing um, too much uh, violence against the trans community. Uh, this morning I was talking with someone like uh, some of the, uh, uh, when you're going to an asylum um, um, uh, judge and trying to explain why you're here, what you're looking for, uh, they sometimes they asking tricky questions and they mention like what are you doing here in the united states while mexico well i'm mexican while in mexico you um it's exists the uh 
the same same uh, gender um, uh, matrimonios the uh, marriage yes yeah. same marriage, same marriage. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, you're right. And also now you can change your name and gender. And then like, okay, but that probably is happening right now. And it's very good for us. But actually, what is happening is we are, or make, or as a Mexican, we live in a macho a culture. Like, they don't believe in that. They don't believe like, if I'm, I mean, I, I declare myself as a transgender female, I'm a trans, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a woman. I feel like, I mean, I'm a woman for any other people. I'm a woman, but actually they don't believe that they, they still like not believe in what are your thoughts and they don't want to, um, they don't want to respect your, um, your, your thoughts and the way you live. So that's why it's still having all those, um, uh, violence, um, attacks, uh, against the transgender community and that's what we're trying to explain to this um to this uh judges judges like we are fighting for a better place to live we are fighting for a better place to stay we don't want to die i know that we have a lot of um violence that are not conscious but we are looking for a safe place and sometimes we find it here in the united states and even in san francisco uh, but also how was uh we were talking about the sanctuary um areas in san francisco east we also have to um apport some some of our knowledge to this um uh new culture that we are facing to and also i want to add a little bit more about the uh how can we protect the sanctuary ordinance in san francisco we have to stay informed we have to um, engage in advocacy. We have to contact local representatives, uh, participate in public hearings, and support local, local organizations, educate to our community. It's very, um, we probably are informed about the, um, all the legislations and, and all the, law, the, the laws are, ha are happening right now, but actually we have to, know more about it we have to read more about it because uh as an asylum seeker um right now i'm still waiting for my asylum but i know that sometimes we like forget that we have to still focusing to help to other people who is coming to this country looking for a freedom um life thank you so much Thank you, Sofia, for all the work that, that you do. Uh, like you said, as, as you yourself are going through uh, the process of asylum seeking and the violence that you're talking about, there are, are trans people in, in, in Mexico, Central America. Um, it's also been faced by our trans people here, as we know, and especially women of color are targeted you know, viciously, um, as, as we know the, with the attacks. And so the solidarity that, that we, need to have uh, you know for those those there and then and then there are those that are back in our countries of origin and i know um uh, Sarah, uh, Gabi, and i know you were just in el salvador and honduras and i did hear from some of our members i uh, just about how um uh, tremendously risky life is for our trans communities um in in central america there was absolutely no protection and and, and those are the the uh the the reasons you know people say well why are people coming here like you said well it's a matter of life and death and and, and that is why they're here um and both deserve to have safety and and to be able to to live to, to, just to live <laughs> and then carry on with whatever we want to accomplish and you, if you can't even do that because of who you are um that's one of the biggest crimes that that that, that has been committed, uh, you know, uh, uh, against our communities. Um, I wanted to um, say just a little bit. I, I since you know we're talking about the, our organizations that, that we do work with, um, and you know all of the, all of this the related. And we know that immigration reform is 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 the umbrella to what we need overall, right? For so many of our of our 
parts of our, the lanes of our communities. There's TPS, there's DACA, um, there is the asylum seekers. Um, and, and, and in my case, what I've, I've been working on um, with uh, amazing organizations like Carecen, Galeria de la Raza, Instituto Familiar de la, de la Raza, and Chicana Latina Foundation, we formed the coalition um, after 2019 when the kids were being ripped away from the arms of their parents and we formed a caravan for the children. Um, and it's, this is a, it's a coalition and we do it, you know, just by uh, blood, sweat and tears. Um, everyone has, has the uh, organizational work and, and, but we have remained very focused on monitoring uh, where the reunification of the children that were separated under the zero tolerance policy of the Trump administration. And so we have monitored the reports by the task force, the interagency task force that was formed by the Biden administration in 2021. And they're the ones that are charged with coordinating the efforts to reunify the more than 5,000 uh, children that were separated from their families. Uh, they're still, and, and many have been reunified. Um, there are still um, anywhere from 800 to 1,000 children that remain separated. And that's why we are keeping our eye, you know, on, on this issue uh, as the caravan for the children. And that's why we sent the delegation to Central America just recently, so they could be in meetings that the task force was there for, and that we help organize by bringing in organizations um, from the communities that need to be there to hear what the task force had to say about how to reunify the families and what is the process and what are the challenges. And so that is the continuation of our work. We will give a report back to the community uh, in a couple of weeks. So we will definitely be um, announcing that. And um, just like everything, um, you know, we're organizers at, at heart and it is the, the involvement of the community and it is personal, individual, and then collective involvement that brings about change. And we have seen that. And, and just by keeping our eyes, you know, in, in Nuestro Norte, you know, our North Star has been, let's reunify those children and let's heal them. That's the other part of it, let's heal them from the trauma that they have uh, suffered. And so we collected over 7,000 plus uh, signatures from just from here from the Bay Area, and we deliver postcards and petitions to the task force. And after that is when they uh, agreed to meet with us. And again, it was it was not just you know the ten of us who were there to meet with them. Um, um, you know, it, as a group, obviously we, we represented a lot. But it was those those signatures, and those were individual signatures. You know, um, and so personal involvement. Everyone's direct involvement is so important on this issue and on really the overall issue of what we're facing in our country and, and what we are going to have to do, um, you know, in the next um, two years and particularly this next year and, and the election is coming. I mean, there's, there's all these things, right? We can't not talk about this. The elections are going to be here in 2024. And the, um, you know, the, 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 Defense of our democracy and our, our right, our, our, our right to participate, to vote, our right to be who we are, our right to our bodies. Um, you know, all of, all of that is is on the line, and 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 our right to to defend uh, and protect um, our undocumented communities. You know, all of that is on the line. Uh, so, um, brothers and sisters that are with us today. Um, you came to learn about Sanctuary City, but I think all of us are also giving you the, the message um, as organizers and activists that we are, um, that, that we need everyone's involvement and we need everyone's participation and we need everyone's voice and we do need to show up. I know there was the, the, uh, the rally um, in front of City Hall when the issue came up about Sanctuary City and many of us showed up and we have to do that. We have to, we have to show up. Um, and, and, and join um, together, you know, um, to to be stronger, to, to, to do whatever it is in our own area of work. Um, and I know that it, 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 it can get overwhelming, I, trust me. Uh, 
but I, I, I'm going to paraphrase a, a quote that I, that I uh, read, which is that, um, you know, it can get very overwhelming, but if we all pull on our own little thread of whatever our work is, that can help unravel the whole damn yarn. That's what the, and so we just continue to pull on our own thread, whatever, whatever work we're doing, let's continue to, to do that. Um, I think we're going to see if there's any questions um, from, from people um, that are, have participated. Um, Eric, I don't know if you are, if you have, have if you see any questions, uh, if not, I think we're coming to, to a close of our, of our conversation. And I know you have some announcements, um, but do, do we have any, any questions um, uh, in the chat or uh, from anybody? I don't see anything right now, but I encourage you to ask the questions to our panelists. And if well, there maybe, isn't, that's I've, okay. I've, yeah, no, I think <laughs> our, our panel have been uh, so thorough and with um, with so many uh, you know good good points. I love this question that just came up. Okay, let's answer it. What keeps you hopeful? Okay, I'm going to start with Sofia this time. What keeps you hopeful? ¿Qué te mantiene con esperanzas? ¿Qué me mantiene con esperanza? Eh, what uh, gives me hopeful is like, I know that not this city hears and the people in the city can hear us and can help us. Just like I just add this, um, uh, este mensaje que yo puse ahorita, discúlpeme que eh, me in English. Eh, it's eh, like vote. Even I cannot, I cannot vote. But please, I wanna, uh, I wanna encourage to others, to the people who is here, to participate, participate in local elections and support candidates who champion immigrants' rights and the sanctuary ordinance. And eh, I want, I. I know that these people here in this panel, I mean, not in the, well, in this panel and in and uh, the people who is listening in this panel, like they can help us to vote for the right person because that's what we, that's what we want. I, I cannot vote right now. I, I might do it in the future, I don't know. But right now, what I, what I mean, gives me uh, with hope is like, then I know that some people gonna hit us and gonna help us to do the right thing. Because I know that the San Francisco, beside it is a, a sanctuary, actually it's a it's it's a place where you can be free, you can be yourself, you can be you, uh, whoever you wanna be because you have the liberty to be your own person. So that's what I, keeps me help, uh, con esperanza, mm -hmm. gracias. Gracias, thank you, Sofia. Uh, and and, and I, I I love the statement that you put on the chat so people can look at that as well. Um, and uh, Sarah Gavigan, what keeps you hopeful? What keeps me hopeful is both that when I meet with um, clients, most of my clients are teenagers. Um, and so what gives me hope is when they, you know, they have hope even after coming the long journey here and they say, I want to, I'm going to be somebody. You know, I don't care what so-and-so did to me or so-and-so. So, I mean, they care, but they're like, you know, despite it all, like I am, I'm going to, I'm going to be somebody and I'm going to um, achieve things in life. And then when we're able to eliminate the risk of deportation for them, they, and they can go on and do that. That's the best feeling. You're like, you just want to celebrate. It's amazing feeling to celebrate someone else, you know, on their path. And I think also what gives me hope is that it feels good to do the right thing. It feels good to help other people and it doesn't feel good. I mean, just at our core, you know, um, at our core, uh, it doesn't feel good to hurt other people. And I have hope and I have faith, honestly, that sometime, you know, that is what is going to, um, someone else, you know, in a, in a decision-making position is going to, to lean towards what feels good. So, yeah. Thank you. That's great. And uh, Sarah Sousa, what keeps you hopeful? 
Um, what keeps me hopeful is my mom. Uh, when I look at her eyes, and you know, despite of her lack of having a status, immigration status, she has hope. She gives me love, my sister and I, uh, and love keeps me strong and, and love for my city, for San Francisco, that welcomed me with open arms when I was 15 years old. And now, you know, uh, the city gave me an opportunity to serve as an aide at City Hall and fight for my people. Uh, and I, regardless of your uh, eligibility to vote, you can still participate as a non-citizen on city commissions. Uh, you can also participate within the county central committees, the Democratic Party, we changed the law. Uh, you can also organize your community. You can engage voters. You can educate voters. You can participate. Voting is not the only way. So I hope that all the students that are listening uh, will be also helping us drive change. Thank you for participating. And I hope together we can make some changes this year and the following, which we're all gonna need to. Thank you. That's so great. And I, I really appreciate uh, what you said about, um, someone put on the, on the chat that um, there are 100 students from UC Berkeley. I say, yeah, go Bears. Um, and, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm a slug, you know, from UC Santa Cruz, but that's okay. Uh, I like the bears too. You know, I and I'll just uh, say for myself, what keeps me hopeful really is young people. Um, and, and especially being on this panel with all of you, you're all younger than I am. I I, I know that. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely what, you know, referred to as one of the OGs. I'm 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 proud to be a, an OG, and and I'm getting used to being called an elder. You know, sometimes people we'll start talking about elders, and I kind of look as if where are they? You know, and um, realize okay, <laughs> that's you you're talking about. And so, young people are the ones who make revolution. Young people have led most of the major revolutions. They have paid the price also as I did when I was a 20 year old and was arrested and tortured in Argentina for being a political activist there. And, and it was individual letters and petitions of people who wrote on my behalf that saved my life. So I know the power of individual action that then turns into a collective action. And it is the collective action that ultimately makes social change. Um, and so, each of us together and encouraging everybody around us and in and, and, and doing it, I'd like you're also Sarah, doing it with love, doing it with compassion, doing it with 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 with, with patience. Um and at the same time, you know, it's kind of like having kind of urgent patience because there is an urgency, there's no doubt about it. And so and at the same time, you know, work with each other, love each other, take care of each other. I tell people, you know, be ruthless with those that are attacking us and be soft and loving with those that are standing by your side, you know, because we need to to, to strengthen ourselves and we need to keep ourselves going. And so thank you for all the students that, that are with us. I think we can we can see you there. Wow, we ran those estudiantes. That's lots of songs in Latin America about, about students and, and student power. And so... Uh, uh, Eric, I think I would just want to thank our, our panelists, uh, Sara Susa, Sara Gavina, and, and, and Sofia. Um, and thank you again, Eric and, and Shiva for, you know, coordinating this beautiful panel, this beautiful conversation, hopeful conversation, um, and to everybody that, that joined us. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Eric. I believe you have some, um, announcements that you want to make. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Olga as our host, Sarah Souza, Sophia, Sarah Gavigan, powerful women, powerful words, great information, and things that we can do to take action. Uh, everyone will be receiving an email from us on ways to take action, how to get involved. One is to become a justice warrior. Another is, is a pledge that you can make to support our sanctuary cities, you as an individual or, or an organization. Um, for our next event, which is Sunday, October 22nd, 2023, Glide Together Sundays will be uh, happening from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. 
We're inviting the public, uh, congregation, departments to engage to build community and to get involved and to take action. So the word, the phrase for today is to get involved and take action. Uh, it's the only way that we'll be able to really uh, make the changes that we need to um, find equity in, in our society. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to our participant. We had over 100 registered and 67 attended, plus a great su uh, surprise by the 100 UC Berkeley. Yeah, that's great. The students, to the students and, and we'll see. Uh, thank you to all of you, mujeres uh, lindas. Yeah. Thank you. Gracias.